Hi, this is Tony Mormino with Insight Partners, and welcome to the Engineers HVAC podcast, where we work to give back to the HVAC community by sharing our HVAC application and design experience. In this live recording of episode 40, our topic is green buildings, green wallets, and engineer's guide to the 179D tax deductions. This does qualify for PDH credits in North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia, so please email me uh, if you need your certification. So, okay, we're going to get right to it. So I'm excited to introduce today's guest, Abby Massey. Is that correct, Abby? That's correct. Okay, sorry. I think I pronounced it wrong <laughs> earlier. Abby Massey, we're so super glad to have you here. Um, she's the Tax Incentives Director for Calvetti Ferguson, and she's focused on sustainability, energy efficiency, and the Inflation Reduction Act. Abby is a certified PE in 45 states. I was It's actually 44 plus the District of Columbia, I just found out. And she is also uh, a project management professional and lead AP certified. So a little bit, Calvetti Ferguson is in the top 200 accounting and advisory firms, a member firm of Prime Global, the Association for Advisory and accounting firms, an award-winning association comprised of more than 300 highly successful member firms in over 100 countries. They are intentional about providing value to their clients and advising beyond accounting. So, Abby, welcome. Thanks, Tony. I'm so glad to be here today. I really appreciate that you invited me on the podcast. Awesome. Well, we're glad you're here. And I was saying this before the podcast, I'm so glad I'm not trying to present this stuff myself because I am just like totally lost in all this. So this will be a great um, podcast, I, I think, for me to learn something too. Definitely for me to learn something. So sure. what we're gonna, here's what we're going to, yeah, so here's what we're going to talk about. Um, and please, if you have a question, throw it in the chat. You know, we'd love to make this interactive and, you know, it's going to be more conversation than it is going to be, you know, about looking at slides and everything. So first we're going to, Abby's going to fill us in on what is 179D. Um, how do we calculate it? What is the process for taking a client through the 179D study? Um, how do design firms qualify? How do contractors mm -hmm. qualify? And then changes to the 179D from the IRA, which is the, uh, I believe it's Inflation Reduction Act. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. I had to look yes. at that a few times. So um, <laughs> if you're listening, don't worry about, you know, you can take notes if you want, but we're, we actually have a one piece flyer, which Heather put together and it looks amazing. And it's going to kind of summarize all this stuff. And you could always rewatch this on our podcast. Uh, Heather, if you want to put up the QR code there, people could zap that anytime during the presentation and then listen to it. Okay. Now let's get to the good stuff. Now let's let the smart person talk. Okay. So we're going to go ahead and get started. So Abby, for those who aren't familiar, and I, I, I totally am going to say I am not familiar at all with the 179D uh, tax deduction for energy efficient commercial buildings. So give us the bird's eye view of what that actually is. Sure. So section 179D is the energy efficient commercial buildings deduction. Um, this is a, a program that was enacted in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. So it's been around for a while. Um, but it just recently has received some big changes in the Inflation Reduction Act, and in 2020, it was made permanent. So now you're seeing a lot more interest in this program. Um, so what it is, it's a tax deduction that's available for the installation of three energy efficient systems. So the, the applicable systems for this program are HVAC and hot water, interior lighting, and building envelopes. So roofs, walls, windows, uh, anything of that nature would be applicable to that building envelope component. Um, it can be for new construction projects or it can be for retrofit projects. Uh, so either would be applicable as long as you're installing one or more of those systems. And the program actually changed in the Infl Inflation Reduction Act, but the original program, you could receive up to $1.80 per square foot uh, if you met certain energy thresholds, and we'll go into the calculation of that here in a moment. Um, with the Inflation Reduction Act, that actually was increased to a maximum of $5 per square foot, so almost three times as much, uh, which is why this is gaining so much attention. Um, it had a it had wow. a in this program. That's a big upgrade. So is this the first year that 
it's five dollars a square foot. This that's uh, right. Yeah, twenty twenty three. Yeah. Yes. That's so a big increase. A lot of, yeah, as you can imagine, a lot of people are really excited about it. Um, there's some requirements that go hand in hand with that five dollar per square foot, and we'll go over that in a little bit. Um, but there is a lot of value to be captured for both building owners and uh, design and contractor uh, companies. Yeah. So just so you know, people who are listening to this, might, we get a lot of mechanical engineers and mechanical contractors who listen to this. So sure. for what I understand, the deduction, and I know you're going to go into this more, but it, it's not just for the owner or whoever's building the building. It also can apply to the, uh, you correct me if I'm wrong, to the mechanical engineers bottom line and the mechanical contractors. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So there's okay. two avenues that this program can go down. Um, it's always centered around commercial buildings. Um, so the folks who can qualify are, first off, commercial building owners who pay taxes. So if you're, let's say you're a private building owner, you own an office building, you have a tax liability, um, then you can take this tax deduction. Uh, it's an accelerated depreciation deduction. If you're familiar with cost segregation at all, um, it's also an accelerated depreciation deduction centered around buildings. It's just been a lot, around a lot longer. Um, so that's kind of the first uh, avenue of, of folks who can qualify. Um, now we're talking about design engineers, we're talking about contractors, how do they fit into this program? So what the uh, IRS added in as a provision to this tax code is in 2008, they said, listen, we realize that a lot of work is happening at government facilities. Government entities don't pay taxes. So this deduction is essentially going to waste because they can't apply it. Um, they don't have any tax liability. So they said, let's allow these government building owners to allocate that deduction to the designers of their facilities. So for instance, if we have an engineering firm mm. who designs a new school for a public school district, that school district can then allocate that deduction to the engineer or anybody who has design responsibility in that project. Because they're not paying taxes? Ex that's exactly okay, right. Okay, gotcha. Mm -hmm. I see yes. now. Hmm. Yeah. So and is that a change a too? Is that new this year? Uh, so the change this year it's the government's being able to allocate this deduction out has been around since 2008, but now okay. as of this year, nonprofits are also able to allocate the deduction. So that's going to be charter schools, uh, religious institutions, uh, nonprofit hospitals. Uh, it opens it up to a lot of other uh, types of entities who now can allocate that deduction out to their designers. So the two big differences are what you just explained, the nonprofits, and then the yeah. change from 180 a square foot to $5 a square foot. And I'm assuming that's a scale based on the efficiency. I think we'll talk about that in the next one. Is that right? Yes. When we go through how it's calculated, we'll talk through the differences because they actually change how this deduction is calculated as well. Um, so we can step through the old method and the new method so you can understand a little bit better about how it was calculated previously and what those changes look like now. Okay. You want to move on to that any more on the what is the 179D question? I think we covered that pretty good. So Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about here is how do we calculate the 179D energy efficiency calculation, which I'm assuming is what most people are asking, like, how do we do this thing, right? So Sure, yeah, absolutely. So um, let's walk through it. The way that we determine a section 1790 deduction rate is through a 3D energy analysis. And so what we're going to do is we're going to compare the building with the uh, project completed. So we will represent the building as it stands with the work that was completed. And we're going to compare it to a baseline standard, which is um, right now for most projects, ASHRAE 90.1-2007. So we're pulling everything, the baseline from Appendix G of that tax code, and then we'll compare it to the building as it stands today. So a common misconception is that we're looking at a before and after uh, of the building, but that's actually not true. We're comparing it to a baseline standard from 2007, which actually is quite beneficial because in right. most cases, we're designing projects to a standard that's much more recent. Right. So on a, let's say on a, I guess we could talk about a new construction example first, right? There's yeah, a school, sure. a high school going to be built. And do they, do they start looking at this before they start the design? 
or do they typically afterwards they say, hey, let's just see if we qualify for this? Or is it something they typically go into it and say, hey, we want to get this $5 a square foot. Here are the ways to do that. Here's the systems we have to design. In most cases, and I think it's actually more because companies are learning about this program now. Uh, mm -hmm. We're coming on the back end of the project near completion, but as companies learn and start to implement this and plan for this in their in their tax position, I think we're going to be brought onto the project uh, earlier and more often so that we can help uh, assess a project and say, this is going to be a good one to pursue. You should plan to have those conversations with those building owners about allocation and moving forward. Um, what I can't do to make sure that I say third party I can't make any design recommendations, but we certainly could, uh, if they have a design ready and it's not constructed, we could build a model and, and report on the results so that everyone understands if they construct the project, where that deduction would lie. Mm -hmm. And is the deduction amount determined based on the the model, the computer model, or do they finish the building? They don't start like metering the building or anything like that, obviously. They look at the model from a uh, 90.1 2007. And then they, they take the same software and they say, here's what we're thinking. We're going to be here. Yeah. So you're correct okay. that it is going to be determined by that energy modeling analysis. So once we compare that actual building versus the ASHRAE 90.1 baseline standard, um, we're looking at the annual energy cost savings percentage. So if that percentage is 50% in the old system, then you would receive that maximum dollar eighty per square foot. If Got the it. building if the building doesn't achieve fifty percent in the old method, you can actually go to something called a partial deduction. And so what the IRS has written up is that we would take a look at the system in the case of the new construction. We would model all of those energy systems, the HVAC, the interior lighting and the building envelope together to try to see if we achieve the 50 percent. If that doesn't work, we can actually take those systems, split them apart and analyze them individually. So what we would do is we would only look at the HVAC's impact on the building. If that hits a lower percentage, then you receive 60 cents. If the interim lighting hits its lower percentage, you receive 60 cents for there. And then mm -hmm. same with the building envelope, it has a lower percentage and you can receive 60, 60 cents as well. So they would break it up into thirds basically. Exactly. And so that gives you an opportunity to still capture value, even if you don't achieve the 50% threshold. That's the old way they used to do it or that's the, okay. Gotcha. Yes. Yeah. That's the old way. So the new way is interesting. They, they, they scrapped the partial deductions. They said, okay, we're going to get rid of those. Um, now we're going to do it on a sliding scale. So we're going to model all of those systems together. Um, the minimum threshold now that you need to reach is 25%. So if you have 25% reduction in annual energy cost savings, you can receive up to $2.50 per square foot. And then it's going to be on a sliding scale up to that 50% mark where you would get the $5 per square foot. So essentially 10 cents for every percentage that you receive. So they've lowered the energy savings requirement and they've increased the rebate even on the basic 25%? Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Now, there is a requirement from the from the Inflation Reduction Act to achieve this um this it's essentially a bonus rate. The $2.50 to $5 is a bonus rate. So there's two requirements, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements that you must achieve on your project. So what those look like is for any of your laborers or mechanics on the project, um, they all must be paid prevailing wages per the location of the building. So that would be something that all of the contractors and subcontractors need to be aware of on the project is making sure that their, their mechanics and laborers are paid those prevailing wages. And then the second piece is the apprenticeship requirement. So depending on when your project begins, there's a certain percentage of hours that need to be performed by apprentices on that project. Um, for 2023, it's going to be 12 and a half percent of the total labor hours on the project should be performed by apprentices. So making sure that the contractors and general contractors, uh, subcontractors on the job are registered in those programs is going to be very important. Um, mm -hmm. But the nice thing is the IRS realizes that, you know, for some folks, this might be a big shift. And 
no one really knows, are there enough apprentices out there for all of these jobs? So <laughs> they've actually added in a good faith effort clause. If you're registered and let's say an apprenticeship program denies your request to send some out on site, or they just don't reply within a certain window of time, then they're saying that you've made a good faith effort to do this and they will go ahead and grandfather you into that rate, the $2.50 to the $5 bonus rate. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, you know, when you said 12 and a half percent apprentice hours, my first thought was, wow, that seems hot. I mean, I I'm coming at it from no experience, like running a contracting yeah. firm, but that seems like a lot of apprentice hours. Um, is it can that, be, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, for anybody who understands when the IRS releases programs like this, um, there's a lot of good intention put in there. And then there's a lot of guidance that follows afterward as people start to work through this program and realize, hey, this isn't working quite the way we thought, or we have a lot of questions around this. So the first uh, issuance of guidance came out at the end of November, which gave a little bit more light on this apprenticeship and, um, and prevailing wage requirements. I expect that there probably will be more maybe this summer or later this year um, to help clarify some of these questions, because I think everybody feels the same is we're not sure if there's going to be enough apprentices for these projects. Um, and are we, you know, are we doing our mm -hmm. good faith effort? Can we call that what we've done a good faith effort? So I think we're going to see more guidance uh, here this year. Yeah, that's good. This is a common theme in the HVAC industry. We get these regulations and stuff come down for refrigerant and energy efficiency. We're like, wait, what? We got to do it. What? You know, we're not being asked. <laughs> we don't get a lot of input ahead of time, but you know, we find a way to deal with it. And this is a yeah. it sounds like a good effort anyway to deal with that. I did get a question from Doug Sanders. First, Doug says Abby is very smart, and Thanks, I agree. <laughs> um, he says, "Does the 179D have a dollar limit allowed on the total return?" Yes, it does. So there's two limitations uh, for 179D seduction, right? So we're talking about the $5 per square foot rate. Let's say you hit that maximum value. Um, the first is the, uh, the deduction can never exceed the cost of the energy efficient property being installed on the project. So for new construction, you're probably never going to run into an issue here. Um, but it's for the smaller renovation projects. Maybe you replace only two air handlers and at $5 per square foot on a large building, that that deduction could very well exceed the cost of that project. Oh, that makes um, sense. Right. Yeah. So it's it's going to be capped. Uh, it's going to be capped in that way. But then when it comes to your return, um, you have to have taxable income to offset uh, to utilize a deduction. So let's say you don't have enough taxable income to offset. You can actually carry these deductions forward into your next tax year, um, but it's this is where it makes sense for you to work with somebody who has CPs in house because they're going to be able to advise you on what's going to make the most sense. Does it make sense to carry those forward even though you're paying some fees now? Could we strategize and maybe only pursue some of your projects to put you in the best best tax position and make sure that you aren't putting yourself in or any other in credits or incentives that you're taking? in a place where they're not going to be as valuable. So it's a good question. Um, it really depends on, on your current tax position, but there, there are some limitations there uh, to be sure that you're actually getting the, the value that we want you to get. Awesome. And Doug, Doug, is very, Doug, you are very smart too. Don't sell yourself short. Okay. So <laughs> Pat Rocco asked, does this apply in New Jersey? I believe it applies everywhere in the U.S. Is that correct? That's correct. It's a federal okay. tax deduction. So anywhere in the uh, in the U.S. is is eligible. Got it. Okay. So just to recap some of the highlights, the changes um, from fifty percent energy savings compared to the ninety dot one two thousand seven went down to twenty five percent annual yeah. energy savings, and now it takes into account all three of the HVC slash hot, hot water, the envelope, and interior lighting. Mm hmm. All three of those together, and then it's a twenty-five to fifty percent um, savings as a scale from two dollars and fifty cents to five dollars for the that's, rebate. That's correct. And just so everybody uh, knows, if you don't meet those prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements, not all is lost. Um, there still is a deduction available for you. It's just going to be um, lowered. So it, the sliding scale then will shift down from 50 cents to a dollar. So 50 cents for that 25% up to a dollar for the 50%. So you'll still receive a deduction. It's just decreased. Got it. Yeah, thanks. Is the prevailing wage 
Um, is the ability to meet that, is that rare or is that mostly people meet that or what's the, do you have any feedback on, on that? Um, I don't, so this is going to be new for everybody in 2023. So I don't have too much experience, but I will say that there are, especially my designers and contractors who are working on government owned projects who say, we already meet these requirements. We don't see them as much of an issue. Um, so we just need to put together some tracking so we can be sure that we've, uh, properly recorded that these things are being met on these projects. Um, for the folks who work on the nonprofits, um, we're going to find out, uh, that's going to be something that we're going to mm. figure out together. So as I get information, I'll be sure to let you know, Tony. Yeah, please. And, and please yeah. come back. We'll have, uh, maybe Abby, if we're nice enough to her, she'll come back here in a couple months and update us and everything. So we'd <laughs> That's love right. to have her back. So we love all these questions. Uh, another question from Eric Yang. Uh, how is the 179D credit split amongst different trades, electrical versus HVAC engineer, a stalling contractor, et cetera? Good question, Eric. So when it comes to being able to share this deduction amongst, let's say, several um, parties who qualify as a designer on a project, it is the government entity or the nonprofit entity's um, choice. They get to decide how this is allocated. Um, so the tax code uh, outlines that they can allocate it to someone who is primarily responsible for the design. In a lot of cases, that's the architect, but in some cases it can be the contractor. Um, or in the case of multiple designers on a project, they can allocate it however they like. Um, so they can choose to give a certain portion to every party who wants to participate. But it is at the end of the day, uh, the building owner's choice as to how they allocate it out. Um, the only thing that they can't do is allocate it to somebody who does not meet the designer requirements. That is not within their rights to do. Or their cousin, Eddie, who owns <laughs> the right. HVAC <laughs> company. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good question. Yeah. Please keep the catch to come. And Heather, did Pat Rocco have a, was she clarifying a question? I saw that somewhere in here. Um, I, wanna... I think I, I just told her thanks for asking the question. Oh, got, okay. I think, gotcha. I think we answered it. Yeah. Heather, you were doing an amazing job. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, let's see here. So I think we had, um, so a LinkedIn user said he has a lot of questions, which is great. Uh, Heather, if you want to throw up my email address, just email me and I'll get to Abby's information um, and we'll, we'll provide some contact information at the end. If you're watching this in the future or listening to this in the future, just check the description of the podcast and we'll, we'll be glad to help you. That's why we're doing this because we want to be able to help you. Um, Let's see here. So Andy Chapman, uh, our PE down in Alpharetta, Georgia. Good morning, Andy. Thanks for joining us. He says, are the wages similar to the David Bacon Act wages that are required on federally funded projects? That sounds like a very well thought out question. Uh, yes, Andrew. So my understanding is yes, um, you can find the uh, wages, the prevailing wages listed on SAM.gov. So if you go to sam.gov and you put in the county, uh, you can find the uh, prevailing wages that are required there. Uh, and then you can compare them back to the David Bacon Act wages. But my understanding is yes from all of the contractors that I have been working with, that they are very close. Great. Boy, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> I'm not trying to present this. Yeah, no, it... sam.gov is a great resource for yeah. that. So um, it's something that I often send my clients to. Okay. Any other thoughts on the calculation process before we move on to um, the process of taking a client through the study? Um, the only other thing that I can add in is that the energy modeling that's required for Section 179D, it looks similar to other um, energy type modeling processes, but there are very specific requirements um, that must be added in that have been prescribed by the IRS. Um, so it is, it is very specific to this program. And so if you decide to work on this, uh, with somebody, be sure that they have experience with section 179D specifically, because you want to be sure that the, uh, analysis that you're doing is, is with compliant with the IRS. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, but yeah, any further details would probably be a little too complicated for this podcast. Yeah, for sure. The IRS are such sticklers, aren't they? Okay. They, 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 they're <laughs> sticklers. 
<laughs> Let's move forward. They don't have a big sense of humor about this stuff. Okay, so <laughs> so we're moving on here. Thank you again, everyone who's listening and, and watching. And um, thanks for the questions. We love it. it. We love having this interactive. So please ask away. Um, in the upper left corner, there's a QR code for our podcast where you could listen to this um, anytime in the future. So the next section is taking the client through a 179D study. So what are your thoughts on that? Sure. So um, Calpity Ferguson and the department that I work with, um, we've set it up a specific way and it's really to put the taxpayer in the best spot possible. So when we do a study, we always scope out your projects before we ever engage a client. So what we're going to do is we'll jump on a call. Um, let's say we've got a design engineer. We'll ask for your project list and we'll review all of your projects with you to understand what's going to fall in the government and nonprofit. What are the new constructions? We'll discuss um, your renovation projects. Are they going to be substantial enough to really um, to really apply and be eligible to receive a deduction? Um, I've been doing this for about eight years, so I know understand roughly if a project's going to impact a building enough uh, to really make it worth pursuing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's going to be the first step. We're going to talk through when your project's completed. So construction completion dictates for a designer, designer or contractor what year you can apply this to tax-wise. So if you have a project completing in 2023, then that would go on your 2023 tax return. Okay. So now who we'll typically talk. contacts you, Abby? Uh, is it gosh. an HVAC sales guy, an architect, an owner, or is it all the above? It, it can be all of the above. So I okay. often go to industry um, conferences. So that's usually where I meet maybe somebody who is just a, a typical design engineer or a head of a practice. But the decision making does come from usually the ownership of that of that um, group. But the more buy in, the better. Right. Because we'll be talking about uh, tax information with the CFO. But when it comes time to actually look at these projects, I need to be talking to the design team to understand what what efficiencies did they mm -hmm. design in there? Is this going to be a good project? What's their relationship with that building owner? Those are the folks that are going to know that information. So we're working with all sorts of people in a company. Um, but having experience and having somebody who has experience to talk through these projects is very important. So a little bit more about my background. I started in building design and construction. I'm a structural engineer by trade. Um, I started my career at an all disciplines architecture firm. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, that helps me be able to navigate and talk through these projects, uh, delivery methods, understanding, you know, the change order process and who's making those decisions um, and really will help marry your work to actual tax. So mm -hmm. I help the CPAs then apply this and understand all the engineering. Side. Gotcha. So, so you're helping from the engineering and the whole building because they don't know the difference between a chiller and air handler, a pump or any of that kind of stuff. Right? Exactly. So, That's gotcha. going to be a foreign language to a CPA. So right. <laughs> yeah. So just I'm like their doing... language sounds to us. Exactly. It's the exactly. same thing, right? Yeah, so we'll do all that up front. And honestly, to discuss a project and get the information we need, just a few minutes, five minutes uh, with gotcha. a knowledgeable person on a project. And we can usually have a good idea if this is going to be a project worth pursuing. Are there any hallmarks um, to where someone says, I've got this type of facility, it's this many square feet, and you could just tell right away that's not really a good, anything jump in mind? Or is it just, is it one of those it depends scenarios? So um, previously with the dollar eighty per square foot, and it would mm -hmm. be for that reduced rate too, where we were capped out at a dollar per square foot. Anything under twenty thousand square feet is probably going to to be tough to really to really substantiate value for the mm -hmm. client. Once you consider our fees and the work done for by your team, it's just going to be difficult to call that a, a helpful project now. If you're qualifying for $5 per square foot, so let's say it's a new construction of a 20,000 square foot building. Well, now we're talking about a 100,000 square foot deduction. So that absolutely could be beneficial for a company. So mm -hmm. with the new change, we can get to the smaller buildings, but if it's an older project, then I would say 20,000 is probably the smallest you wanna go. Okay, that's good to know, 20,000 square feet. Now, I had a, like a thought when you were explaining that. It, are they typically, going for this to offset the cost of 
the upgrade of the equipment to higher efficiency? Is that typically like, okay, we're here. If we go to this type of system, which is X more efficient, it'll pay for itself with the deduction. Or is it a, usually a partial part of it? And I know that depends. There's like a million different ways you could design a system, but is there any, does yeah. that, I don't know if I pose that question properly, but. I think I understand. So you're asking, are, are they using and understanding the section 179 deduction as a, as a way to counterbalance an increased cost for maybe a more efficient product being installed? Right. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Um, I haven't seen it much, but I think that is what's going to happen now. With the increased value and in how much you can right. receive, I mean, it's just in the best interest of everyone, the designer, the contractor, and the building owner to work out a way for maybe more, uh, more efficient equipment to be installed so that you can receive that higher deduction rate. And it very likely will, uh, it will pay for itself, which is wonderful. I'm seeing a lot of companies coming out um, and starting to put these wheels together and offer it as a service. Um, they're, they're kind of collecting all of the incentives and rebates together and saying, listen, we can, we can implement these energy efficient projects and then ex we will help you pursue these, these incentives and rebates so that you can, they can pay for itself essentially. Yeah. That's a no brainer if that washes yeah. out that way or, or gets mm -hmm. you 90% there, 80% there just as good, you know? Then, then you're only looking at a year or two payback with the energy cycle. So, exactly. okay. Yeah. So super great information. Um, we got a few more questions here. I'll just throw some at you here, Abby, see if we can um, make some headway with some of these. So sure. how, how, how often do you see the designers having the deduction allocated from non-private owners? So for government owners all the time, I've worked with uh, clients all over the country uh, and with government owners, um, there are plenty of programs all over the country that absolutely participate. Um, so some of them don't participate for their own reasons. I mean, it is government building owners and it's a little tricky, right? They're giving money back to their designers, um, but some it's just because they don't know about the program or they've never been approached about the program. So it's just a knowledge thing. The mm -hmm. nonprofit entities, that's going to be new for us this year. Um, so far, I've started conversations um, with nonprofit entities for the clients I'm representing now, and, and we're working through it. We're doing education. We're helping them navigate the program. And I, I do think you're going to see a lot of nonprofits who are interested to participate as well. Awesome. Okay. I think we may have talked about this, but the next question is, what is, the, what is required for a nonprofit or tax-exempt organization to allocate the deduction for a, to a designer? Sure. So what needs to happen is an allocation letter must be signed by the building owner. So the government or, or nonprofit and the party who will be claiming it. Mm. Uh, this allocation letter, it's spelled out in the tax code exactly what needs to be on there. Um, some examples are the building address, the cost of the project, uh, the police and service date, and then some other statements that must be included. Once that slip is signed, then that deduction is the right is the rights of whoever is going to receive it. So let's say it's the design engineer. Um, the only other thing that needs to happen for the study is someone like myself, a professional engineer, needs to go on site and visually verify that the project is complete. So oftentimes um, your government owner or your nonprofit assists with that. Um, they're going to help us coordinate that visit. Um, but that's really the only requirement on their side. Awesome. I'm glad that was asked. We did not go through that. Thank you so much for that detail. And thank <laughs> yeah, you for the question and the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's another one. How do, how detailed does the energy model need to be? That's a great question. I was thinking that too myself. So. Um, so like I said, it's a little bit different than other energy analysis that you might do for other reasons. Um, we're going to go very detailed into the systems that we are analyzing. So that would be your lighting system, your HVAC system, and then the building envelope. So as much energy efficient information as you can provide to us and from the specs or the drawings for that system, we're going to put that into the energy model. Now, the off systems, um, they are set by very basic guidelines. So those are going to be um, maybe Title 24 references, other ASHRAE references, um, even the utility rates. Um, those are coming from um, government resources. So those are all going to be very standardized across the country. Um, so it just, it's the details are in our systems that we're analyzing. The rest is, is really, um, pulled from tables and references and won't be modeled to such detail. Gotcha. 
Okay. Here's a few more questions here. Thank you all so much for the questions. This is great. This is really yeah. makes it a lot more fun for uh, for Abby and I. That's for sure. Um, there was a question here. How how much cost does this add to the project? And I'm assuming that is maybe from the standpoint of uh, your fees or whoever other fees would be uh, required. Um, yes. So. I for the cost of the project, if we're talking about um, the prevailing wage and apprenticeship part, that's going to be dependent upon, you know, if it's government, probably not much because they're already doing that work. Um, but when it comes to our fees, um, we usually set them based on the deduction we expect you to, to achieve. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's really based on our time and materials, but also we're going to make sure it doesn't, you know, take too much of your deduction. That's why we scope up front and review those projects up right. front before we put an engagement letter together. Um, so it, it depends on the project. It depends on how much work needs to be done. It depends on the size. So I, I can't really give you a specific number, but that's how we price them time and materials. And we just, we make sure that we aren't going to take a huge chunk of your deduction because at the right. end of the day, we want you as the customer to walk away with the benefit. This whole process screams early involvement. Yeah, the earlier not, the better. Not last honestly. minute. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and if you get a good provider that you trust, you'll be working with them on a lot of projects, and so you'll get into a great rhythm. It's really not a lot of work from your team if you've done one, understand what's needed, and get in a rhythm with a, a trusted provider. Yeah. Once you do the first one, you I'm sure it just cracks open a lot of like fears and concerns and questions you have mm -hmm. and everything like that. So great. Absolutely. So uh, Mike Scone asks, are there any, so we talked a little bit about like, you can't change out a 5,000 CFM air handler in a, you know, 30,000 square foot hospital and claim a deduction for, you know, $5 per square foot, or whatever. So, but he, but this is a, a good question too. Are there any limitations <laughs> as to the size of the project, like just a minimum square foot, like there's, is there a cutoff minimum or maximum or anything from a square footage standpoint? Um, is my rule of thumb is if it's impacting less than 20% of the building, it's probably not going to impact the energy savings enough to result in a deduction. Again, there, there are some projects that fall outside of those bounds. When you think of like a chiller replacement, for instance, mm -hmm. if we're going to do the chiller, the VFDs, maybe the pumps, the square footage of that space might not be 20% of the building, but let's talk about how much of the equipment it's serving. If it's serving that entire building, well, then that's probably going to be a good project to analyze. Mm. So it, that's why we talk about those projects in depth. But my rule of thumb, 20% or less of the building, we probably need to consider that it might not actually achieve a deduction. Excellent. Good, good rule of thumb there. And if you got any questions, call us and we'll Get you in trouble, Abby, cuts with Abby and or call her direct and we'll give you that information here in a little bit. So, um, yeah. So Andy had a, a question about like in rural areas where the wages are lower um, mm -hmm. and, and we probably haven't seen this yet because this is new, but is the prevailing wage causing us a problem and kicking us out of the out of the uh, rebate possibility? And then, you know, maybe that comes in where the um, what was the what did the term we use where they kind of give you a little bit of forgiveness if it's in a special situation. So have you seen anywhere it's like in a rural, like in Georgia, we do a lot of jobs that are in rural counties, right? School boards that sure. are not very large and the wages are probably lower than in like a big cities. Sure. Um, well, the prevailing wages are always going to be set based on that, the locality of the building. Um, so it would be whatever the prevailing wages are in that rural county. I haven't had a whole lot of experience yet with this, so I can't say if I've had any issues with rebates um, at this point in time. Um, but again, that can be something we can maybe catch back up later this year. I can let you know what we're experiencing there. Um, if they do, I'm hoping, and usually they come through for us, the IRS will usually make adjustments, um, right? Because the intent of the program isn't to kick you out of all the other programs. The intent is to incentivize everyone to continue to pursue energy efficient projects. So if for some reason it does become an issue, hopefully the IRS will issue more guidance where we can hopefully be mm -hmm. able to capture both. Good. Yeah. And I suspect that would probably be the case for sure. So if people kept coming back. Well, we can't do it because of the wage portion. They're going to have to give some, give some exactly. leeway on that. So, um, yeah, so great. We, and again, we appreciate all the questions. We got some more questions mm -hmm. here, so we'll just keep going with questions and maybe we'll just answer all, everything we're going to present. This is great. So, <laughs> sure. um, 
Pat has a really good question. I thought about this too. Like she's asking, so the engineer who has to go to the site and verify it, could that be the design engineer, someone who works at the design engineer's office, right? Yes, so, Pat, this is an important point. Um, so there are two things that must be done by a third party qualified individual and a qualified mm -hmm. individual per the tax code is a licensed individual who's not a part of the um, design team or the building owners team. So it's going to be that site visit needs to be done by that third party qualified individual professional engineer like myself um, or, or excuse me and the certification. So at the end of the design. Once we've determined the deduction rate, we've done the energy model, a certification is sealed by an engineer. And that says that we did the energy model in compliance with the IRS's guidelines and that a site visit has been completed. So those two pieces are very important and they must be done by a third party. Excellent. And that makes that makes total sense. Now, Not I that our any customer, any of our customers would ever be dishonest, but you never know. Right. It, you know, it just keeps everybody, uh, sure. keeps every, everybody straight. So the energy modeling, I think I saw a note somewhere. Can the energy modeling be done by the design team? Technically, yes, except what you're going to run into is that most third-party engineers need to be involved enough to put their seal on it. Uh, so by the time that that happens and trying to train a team as to what the requirements of the IRS are that are different from their typical energy mm -hmm. modeling, it just makes sense for our team to take it. That does make total sense. Yeah. Okay. Another question from Paul. Uh, thank you, Paul. I don't understand this question, so maybe it'll make sense to you because I'm not in the middle of, I'm not a designer. So um, how many months of post-implementation energy bills are required for the EUI reduction pathway? Paul, I think you're referring to the new method that has been released. So essentially the IRS added a new provision and this is complete. There was no existing method before where if you don't receive the full $5 per square foot, you can then go back and essentially meter the building to determine if energy savings was achieved as a result of the project and capture some of that benefit back that was missed in the first analysis. Um, this is completely new. It's new to me as well. We haven't had any projects that we can even do this on yet because they haven't started yet. So I think more guidance will be issued on this very specifically because nobody understands exactly what they want us to do. So I, I will get back to you on that. There is no guidance yet though on how much uh, or how much uh, information needs to, to be provided for this. So uh, stay tuned. We'll catch up at the end of the year and I'm sure we'll have some more information for you there. Episode two. That's right. <laughs> That's right. Abby, Abby part two. Okay. Uh, John San Juan asked if this could apply to uh, large size commercial refrigeration projects, like maybe a food manufacturing facility or something like that from the refrigeration that system, or is it just HVAC? It's just HVAC and hot water. So gotcha. if the project includes an HVAC component or a lighting component, um, then absolutely. Um, but if it is purely the only part of the project is refrigeration, then unfortunately for 179D purposes, it just, it doesn't fit within the program. Awesome. Good question. Everybody. Thank you. Um, Heather, please chime in if we missed a question or two, I'm going to just pop us over to the next section here. Um, or did you have anything else on this particular section, Abby, or are we okay to move I forward? Think, I don't think so. Um, the only thing I can tell you is that. Um, if you decide to look into this, um, a provider should take you the whole way through it and they will be able to navigate you through this program very well. Um, but be sure that you talk to them. Um, as 179D got enhanced in the Inflation Reduction Act, a lot of new providers are coming out there. So be sure you vet your providers, understand their experience, not only in the industry, but also with 179D. So important for sure. It is. Okay, so we've we've answered you've answered so many good questions there. Um, you tell me, do we have anything left um, about you know how does a design firm qualify for the one hundred seventy nine D tax deduction? You want to comment on that a little bit? Um, yeah, so design firms um, they qualify um, for most of their projects, especially obviously if they're government and nonprofit. So that would be the types of projects that we're looking at. Um, the tax code in, in notice 2008-40 defines a designer, a qualified designer, as someone who creates the technical specifications for the installation of the energy efficient equipment. So that is the 
tax code definition. So an architect and engineer who is creating the plans and the specifications for a project, that act is going to qualify you as a designer. Um, the only piece to keep in mind is it must be for the energy efficient equipment that we are looking at for this program. So that's your HVAC, interior lighting and building envelope. Um, so like a, oh, an interior designer, that's not going to fit within the program because even though they're creating plans um, or a landscape engineer, civil engineer, those aren't impacting the systems that we're looking at. So in most cases, they're not going to qualify, but an architect, a mechanical engineer, an electrical engineer, in some cases, a plumbing engineer, all of those would fit within the program. Nice. Okay, that makes sense. And we've got a question from the one and only Greg Crumpton, um, podcast aficionado, Greg Crumpton. And he says, should we include M and V instrumentation? I I'm, just, I'm not sure if that's mechanical and ventilation instrumentation. Maybe you can clarify that, or maybe, Abby, you know what that is. On the original design for providing the results on the tail end. So should we include instrumentation on the original design for providing results on the tail end? Looks like Heather froze up. We'll just give her just a second. Oh, you're back. Paul says, thank you. Oh, measure and validation. Thank you, Greg. We'll give Heather a chance to come back here. Welcome to live streaming. Okay, we got some other questions here. And just until uh, uh, Abby, I'm sorry, until Abby comes back, um, just a reminder, you can... Oh, you're back. Just a reminder, you can always watch this on our podcast. Um, you can watch it or listen to it on the podcast, or you could watch it on our YouTube channel. The QR code for our podcast is in the upper left-hand corner, and we'll give Abby a minute. She'll pop back in. This happens all the time. We're live streaming, so it's no big deal. I'm sure she'll be right back. Um, we just got a few more slides here. Email me, Heather, if you don't mind putting my email up. Email me if you want to get in touch with Abby or myself. And also if you want PDH codes, uh, PDH credits, just email me. Hi, Abby. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> can you hear us? <laughs> it's okay. You got, I, can, I got a chance to catch up on me? some uh, housekeeping stuff. We can hear you. Yeah, it's great. Oh, good. It's oh, all, good. this is just live Sorry streaming. About it's, that. Uh, <laughs> no problem at all. It's absolutely no problem. I was just telling people how to get a hold of us if they need to get a hold of us. So, um, yeah. So sure. we're glad you made it back here. This happens all the time. So, me as so well. Greg Crumpton. Well. I think we were in the middle of some great questions. Yeah, I know, right? The most brilliant stuff <laughs> happens when I'm not online. That's for sure. Um, okay. So Greg clarified measure, measure and validation. So should we include measure and validation instrumentation on the original design for providing results on the tail end? You certainly can. I don't think it's going to be a requirement that it has to be a part of the project, um, but it is going to be a now it is going to be a before and after. So if we get into the second half where we're doing that verification, it's going to be important getting with your um, building owner up front because I believe you have to pull data from a year prior. So a year prior to the to the completion of the project. So know that that's a requirement. It should be having those conversations really as soon as you get in touch with those building owners so that you can understand, do they have that data already? Is the project going to take a year and we start it now? We can start collecting that data and then have something to measure against once we've completed the job. So um, something to consider. Excellent. Thank you, Abby. Thank you, Greg, mm -hmm. for your question and involvement as always. Um, so the next section here, you know, how do contractors qualify for the 179B? tax deduction. Yes. So this is really where um, there's, it's good to know somebody who understands what's going on. So we've said the term designers a lot, and that's because the tax code calls them designers, a qualified designer. And so for most contractors, they say, well, we aren't designers, right? This obviously mm -hmm. doesn't apply to us, but it's that definition of what a designer is. That's really where we need to hone in. As a matter of fact, after that definition in the tax code, 
The IRS goes on to say a designer can be an architect and engineer, obviously, but then they say also contractors, uh, it can be an energy service provider. So they're going through and saying, we understand we're using the term designer, but it can apply to other folks. So when it comes to a contractor, here are some ways that they see somebody um, meeting that designer definition. Um, obviously, design build projects where you're hand in hand making recommendation, design assist contracts as well. Um, your expertise is being applied in the design process. That's what we want to see. Um, also, direct to owner. So if you are, let's say, contracted by a school district, they say, we're having issues with our system. Can you please come out and look and tell us what it, what's going on? You're going out, you're doing all of the assessment of the existing equipment. You're putting together the, uh, the solution. You're, you're saying, listen, we're gonna, you need to replace this equipment. We're going to reroute these things here. Here's what we would recommend and the equipment that we would select to be installed as a replacement for anything that needs to be replaced. Well, there's no architect, like you are the designer, you're the one creating mm -hmm. those technical specifications for those projects. So in the case of a designer, it's not going to be, or excuse me, a contractor, it's not going to be every single project, um, but it will be some. Um, so thinking about what you take on as a company, um, absolutely, there could be some some nice sized projects in there that, that meet those requirements that you can pursue for this deduction. Excellent. So it sounds like they're doing a good job of trying to include everybody in the possibility of this to move the absolutely. move the buildings into more green, green centered kind of way. So, yep, yeah. Right. And there was there was just some guidance issued. Um, there was a, a court case that occurred um, very specifically for an HVAC contractor who did um, some design of the sequence of operations on the control system, installed some new controls for um, some equipment that was uh, no longer working. And the court said, yeah, absolutely. This meets, this meets the design criteria. So uh, know that if you're doing that work, it's, it's, it has, it has stood the test. Excellent. Okay. And the last thing we're going to comment on here, and then we'll have another question or two, and then we'll we'll sure. wrap it up. But uh, yeah, I think you talked a little bit about the changes to the 179D from the Inflation Reduction Act. Yes. So just to recap, so that we can be sure that we all understand the changes, because they are significant and important. Um, so the first is that increased deduction rate. So we're going from $1.80 per square foot up to that bonus value of up to $5 per square foot. So almost three times as valuable. Um, that will be, and all these changes will be in, enacted this year, 2023, moving forward. Um, the second, now, instead of just the government owners being able to allocate these deductions to designers and contractors, we have included nonprofit entities. So any nonprofits that you might be doing work for that are completing projects this year or moving forward, they can now allocate the deduction. And number three is just the change in the um, prevailing wage and apprenticeship requirements for that bonus value. So knowing that that's going to be something to implement in projects or ask your owners about, your, if you're in the case of an engineering firm, you will need to co coordinate with your contractors. Um, so being able to bring that up upfront about the prevailing wage and the apprenticeship requirements is important. Um, so those are really the three biggest changes. The fourth, I would say, is the energy modeling, but that's on our side. We'll take care of that for you. We'll handle it. Yeah, exactly. That's right. That's awesome. <laughs> well, real quick here, and then we're going to wrap it up. But thank you all so much again for watching. Thank you for your questions. We have just a few more things here. And again, upper left corner is a QR code to our podcast. If you want to re-listen to this, have at it. Uh, my email address is there for PDH credits and also for um, this fantastic one sheet that Heather put together. So it has all the information on who to contact, where to get started, how to get a hold of us. Um, if you're in, if you're in our in Insight Partners backyard, if you're in North Carolina, South Carolina, or Georgia, just call your Insight Partners rep. We'll take care of it for you. Or you could email me, and I'll be glad to share. You know, give you Abby's information. If you're watching this in the future or listen to this again, check the description of the podcast or or whatever you're watching it on, and, and Abby's information will be in there as well. So hopefully she'll be able to, to help you out. And there was one other quick question. I think you may have touched on this. There's been so many good questions and so much information. My head's a little jarbled, but um, <laughs> that tax deduction can be split among different firms, like architect, engineering firms. It's really up to the owner, right? 
That's that's exactly correct. It's the owner's discretion as to how many people they allocate to. The only thing they can't do is allocate to someone who doesn't meet those design qualifications. Got it. Excellent. Okay. So I think we, um, yeah, thanks everyone for listening. Okay. I was just, I was just checking the comments there one more time. So yeah. So email me. Thank you, Abby, so much. And if you got, if you all that are listening liked what Abby provided, please like this video. We'd greatly appreciate it. Or, and, and if you know someone who would benefit from this, I think very extremely valuable information, please forward this, share this, uh, you know, podcast or video with them. We'd greatly appreciate it. And thank you all so much for watching. Uh, Abby, if you could stick around for just a minute or two in the waiting room, I'll be right back with you. Thank you, Pat. We appreciate it. Thank you, Jane. And uh, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Abby. Thanks, everyone. I'm, I'm so glad to be here. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Awesome. Thank you so much, Abby. 